So I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, fun, fun and threefolds, especially, especially uh, the 95 families of hypersurfaces. <clears throat> so uh, the XD in P1, A1. A2, A3, A4, with some of the AIs equals D, and these are these are crazy smooth. <clears throat> anyway, I'll come back. I'll come back to this in a minute, in a while. But I'm I'm really talking. Uh, the thing I'm really interested in in now is the birational geometry. Especially these are these are the thing we call rigid, <coughs> uh, and uh, so it's in this uh, book CPR, Corti, Corti Cuff, read. So this is about uh, ten. About ten, ten years ago, about fifteen years ago, we ran a conference in uh, in uh, Warwick, and then we wrote this book as a as a consequence of it. So the the, the however <coughs> our, our main point really is that you study birational geometry in terms of biregular. So I'll 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 explain I'll explain what I mean by biregular and birational. Uh, <coughs> Uh, later, and uh, especially graded rings. So I'm doing something which, uh, on the face of it, is uh, is is geometry. I'm asking about the birational auto, birational maps of these of these varieties, for example, between themselves or with other varieties. Uh, but it then turns out that most of the calculations involve these uh, graded ring methods. So this is a long paper and I'm only going to be able to describe a small part of it. <clears throat> but let me start with an example of in, in, birational involution. So uh, this is in some ways a sort of uh, elementary idea, at least what I'm going to say about it now. L let, me, let me give an example. So you know, you could, always, you could also work with that big guy over there, but uh, uh, for the moment, let, let's just stick to the simple example. So I do hypersurface of degree 111 of degree 7 in this way to projective space. So, and I'm going to take this to be general. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm going to call the variables here x, y, z, t, u. <clears throat> and so, if we ask, I want I want this thing to be quasi smooth, and I want to just I want to justify this. So, uh, at p t. So the point zero 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 one zero, t is one, and everybody else is zero, right? Uh, the thing we've got here is so I want to know how this guy t appears in the equations. So it turns out the the, the interesting thing is I'm going to think of this as u t squared, and then plus a t plus b, right? So the a the A is of degree 5, and the B is of degree 3. <clears throat> so the T cubed could also appear, but uh, um, if T cubed appears, I can just absorb it into U. So I'm assuming this term is here. If there were a term T cubed, I could just replace U by U plus a little bit of T, and, get and the T cubed is contained in there. Right? So the, the point is... A birational involution. Involution means 
a group action of order two, and the point about this is that this is quadratic. So these are going to be quadratic involution. So I explained last time that uh, <clears throat> they can, if, I, if I set t equals 1, then uh, I can express u as a function of the other variables using the implicit function theorem. Except I still have to divide out by, so this is a point of type, a half of 1, 1, 1, and the coordinates on this, the local, local the orbinates, the local orbifold coordinates on this point are x, y, z. Right. So here it's very convenient that the guy I eliminated is the guy of degree 3 and everybody else is of degree 1. Right. And so then at PZ, I have similarly, I have this, I'm sorry, not Z, PU. If I'm standing at this point, then this guy is of degree at most 2 in this equation. Right. And so he might be X U squared and then plus uh, a times u plus b. <coughs> Sorry, that's uh, and uh, th 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 of course not the same. And this one is four, <coughs> right? And so again, this is a quadratic equation in uh, u, right? And so at this point, I have this one third of. 1, 1, 2, and the 1, 1, 2 are, so I just decided that the little linear term in front of this u squared has got to be something, it might as well be x, and so this is y, z, and t. <coughs> yes? So, so let's look at this, this one first. So this is a quadratic equation. So, uh, for u over the other variables. Yes, and uh, with a quadratic equation, if I've got one root, then I know another root. And so, uh, u maps to a minus u, uh, except it's a over x1 minus u. Right. This is a surefire way of going from one point of this hypersurface to another point of this hypersurface, provided the x, the x is not zero. Yeah. <coughs> yes? So this guy here is uh, an involution of the function field of... Uh, x. So I go to this function field C of x. So C of x is, is generated by homogeneous ratios between these guys. <coughs> if I don't have u in there, then here's a quadratic equation for u. So, it's, so <coughs> if I take <coughs> the field of this way to project to space 1, 1, 1, 2, I get a certain field then I have a quadratic extension of that field. When I have a quadratic extension of the field, I have a, a field automorphism of degree 2, an involution, and it's, and it's given by this. Right? It's just how to get from one root of this to the other root, interchanging the two roots. Yes? So that's a <clears throat> this is a birational description because it's talking about the function field. So, so this is the thing that's birational. And I want a biregular description of this. So I'll explain uh, in the second half that there is, there's a simpler model of this that you can already see in the case of cubic surfaces. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but the thing I, uh, the, <clears throat> the thing I want to the thing I want to look at now is suppose I do. Suppose I do this weight, this projective space, one, 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 two, three, 
and then I just do this sort of basically stupid operation, just omit u. Right, then where, except at this point, this is a morphism. So this is just exactly like taking ordinary projective space and projecting away from one point. <coughs> so this is, in, in ordinary straight projective space, this would just be the linear projection map. Yes? And so if I, if I take the x in there, so, so this operation here, this rational operation, is the thing that's giving this uh, um, quadratic extension, uh, extension of quadratic fields, right? And so what does this do at the point P? So if I'm at the point PU, then of course this map's, this is the point where this map is not defined. So if I want to understand that, the thing I'm going to do is a blow up. And uh, so I better have a notation for this. So let me call this uh, first step Y. So this is the so this P in this P and U is isomorphic to a third of one one two. Yes, with uh, Y, Z, and T as cardinals. <coughs> uh, as, as far as the whole, whole way to projective space is concerned, it's a third of 1, 1, 1, 2. It just adds the X. It doesn't make any difference. Right? And so, but, I, but what I want to do is X is the 1, 1, 2 weighted blow up. <coughs> of this point. Right? So, uh, to, to explain this, so if I, uh, and I, I, <clears throat> I want to do this more generally, uh, in, the, in the paper we do it a lot more generally, there's some, something called, I want to look at the singularity, the, the terminal cyclic quotient singularity, 1 over R of 1A and R minus A. Yes? And so this is a threefold, this is a quotient of C3 by the group action mu R, by the cyclic group of order R, which I'm thinking here is the roots of unity, right? And this is a toric variety with the lattice L, which is Z3 plus Z times 1 over R, 1, A, R minus A. Right? And uh, so, uh, you know, this singularity, now I'm working in a local affine model of the singularity, it's, project, it's locally analytically isomorphic to this thing, right? And what I'm supposed to do is draw this Z3, yes, draw the, so I just to, in order to see the lattice, I'm going to draw the unit cube, right? This is just the unit cube for Z3. And then inside there, I have this slightly bigger lattice. So this slightly bigger lattice looks something like this. Whoops. Okay. This uh, l lattice looks something like this. Here I've got the plane where y plus z is equal to 1. So that's this vertical plane. And here I have this smallest point on it. So in general, the other, there are other points here. Right? So the trick, the trick here is that if I take, if I take the cosets of L modulo z3, right, I can think of all of that is being contained, uh, one representative of those cosets being contained inside this unit Q, and then these points here are all contained on this plane. Right? That's a very special thing about this, uh, about having a one here and these two guys adding to zero. Yes? And so, and of these points here, there's one 
which is the lowest. Right? It's on this plane and it's, got, it's the lowest above the ground. Right? And it's also the lowest above the, if I draw the junior simplex here, the simplex generated by the three coordinate vectors here, then this is standing just a little bit above there, but it's the smallest amount above there. Right? And so anyway, uh, this weighted blow-up means I take this vector here, which is the smallest vector, and I make a barycentric subdivision. Right? This is just standard construction of uh, toric geometry, a barycentric subdivision of this uh, lattice cone. Right? I mean, if I was looking at it from above, I'd probably want to do something like this. <coughs> yes? And then, uh, so, so the effect of doing this is here I've got x, here I've got y, and here I've got this point, which is this singularity, this one, one third cyclic quotient singularity, and here I get this p, which is p of, in this case, 1, 1, 2, in general, 1, a, r minus a. Right? So this is a, this is a blow up, it produces one divisor, which is the toric surface corresponding to this, to this thing. Right? So if I call this E, then you find that KY is KX plus 1 over R times E. Right? So this is a terminal quotient singularity. If you resolve it, every exceptional divisor here appears with strictly positive uh, discrepancy. But this discrepancy is exactly the height of the point above this plane. Right? And so it's this smallest possible value. Right? So, so if I was doing this on a... So, so, so this E, E is isomorphic to this, this space. So in this case it's, uh, the, it's isomorphic to P112, which is the ordinary quadratic code. Right? And the point about this is that the, uh, this surface, exceptional surface, has class group 1, which means that this is a, so the, the, this y goes to x is an is a, is a extremal contraction in the Murray category. Right. So this means x and y both have terminal q factorial singularities. This is a, a morphism with minus k ample. So minus ky is ample for this, uh, this blow up. Let me call this map sigma. <coughs> right. So this is, an, this is a, a, a Mori extremal contraction. Right, and then there's a theorem of Karl Mutter that says uh, this blow up is the unique uh, extremal, extra, extremal, extremal contraction, wh which is not isomorphic, not an isomorphism over P in X. Yeah? So, let, 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 let me just say the statement again here. Suppose I've got a quasi-projective variety X having this one third of one A, uh, having this one R of one A R minus A singularity. Suppose I've got any Murray extremal contraction from some other quasi-projective variety down to X that is not an, that's an extremal contraction and that's not an isomorphism over P, then it is necessarily this weighted blow-up. It's this simple construction of toric geometry. Right? This is a very powerful result. Anyway, uh, to, continue, to continue what I'm doing here, so I start off with this X having this... Uh, 
um, this x, uh, I mean this case, right? Uh, the x is the hypersurface given by this equation, and I'm operating near the point pu, right? So I make this operation here, which goes to y. This is the Mori, this is the Kalmata blow up. Right, and now, now the thing I want to do is map down to, uh, let me, let me, I don't know, uh, let me write down to Z, and I want this Z to be, I want this Z to be the anti-canonical model of Y. Okay, so uh, in, this, in this paper, we write minus kx is a for the ample divisor, so it's really the O of 1 for this uh, weight projective space restricted to x. Right, so uh, who is y? Well, if I write down minus ky, then he's the pullback of, there's a sigma upper star here, I'm not bothering to write. It's a pullback of A, and then minus 1 over R of E. Yeah? And so I'm taking sections, I'm taking elements in the homogeneous coordinate ring of X, and then I'm demanding that they vanish a little bit on E. Right, so I'm getting a slightly bit smaller ring. So here I'm describing this process of deleting this element u from the ring and making this projection downwards here, but I'm doing it in Mori theoretical terms. Yes. And so what the, what, what's happening here is uh, I'm doing I'm going to, I, I'm doing um, I'm doing R of y and b so the b is minus ky Right, and so this is contained in R of X A, and it's the set of homogeneous elements of degree D in this ring, so sections of D times this KY, right, vanishing D over R times, in this case D over three times on uh, e. Yes, and so if I take if I take the so here I've got x and then I've got y z t u. Right, this u doesn't vanish doesn't vanish at all. This is a unit at p. So he doesn't he doesn't vanish on u. He doesn't vanish on e at all. So I've got to exclude him. On the other hand, these guys here vanish, you know, uh, there's an orbifold thing going on. I'm not going to explain it. They've, these vanish one-third, one-third, and, one, and two-thirds on E. Right? So these guys here remain in this subring. Yeah? So what about X? Well, for, for X, we go to this equation. So I had this equation, x u squared plus a4 plus, um, sorry, plus b7, right? And so earlier I was saying that the element x can be excluded by the implicit function theorem. However, this is saying that this x... This x looks something like, of course, the x is involved in A4, but in any case, the x has to vanish. This, so if I do x times all of that stuff, then he's, he's like an element of degree 7 in the ring. Sure, I can take the x out there. It's, uh, uh, it's not a big deal, right? So it turns out that x vanishes at least one-third on E. And much better than this, 
x u vanishes raising the four thirds on e. Right? And so why do I say that? So I say, let's look at this equation here and let's rewrite him as x squared times u squared plus a4 xu plus b7. plus x times b7. I've taken this equation, I've multiplied them by x. Yeah? And so this is now a quadratic equation, not in u, but in xu. So now this is xu squared plus a4 times xu plus x times b7. Right? So uh, my assertion is that the ring R of y b is the polynomial, the the ring generated by x, y, z, t. And remember, I've, I've omitted the u, but this, this equation says I keep the x. I keep this v. I'm going to call this v x, u. Yes? So this guy here, v, is certainly now integral over k, x, y, z, t. Yes? And so this z here now is in wedge projective space 1, 1, 1, 2, 4. And he's got coordinates x, y, z, t. And I omitted v, uh, u, but I kept v. Right? And so, you know, basically, the, the thing I'm doing is sort of basically keep, uh, t keeping track of this denominator x. Okay, I hope, I hope, I hope this is clear. <coughs> so I'm passing from the ring of x to the ring of b. And so the ring of b is just this tiny little bit less. I'm subtracting off this little bit of discrepancy from the anticanonical divisor. Right? And that means that, that, means that I, I define this subring, and I told you the whole the, the, ser the subject to the series of lectures is uh, graded rings. I'm calculating the new graded ring corresponding to this this condition here, and uh, you know I'm not allowed u, but I'm allowed x u. And having done that, this is the uh, anti-canonical model. Yes. And so what's happening here is I, I take the x, I've got this point P in x, above there I've got this wedge projective space, 1, 1, 2. <coughs> right, and then that's getting mapped down isomorphically here to his 1, 1, 2, to 1, 1, 2 in there. So the z contains E. Right, now what's good about this What's good is that this hypersurface, so the z, the z there is given by v squared plus a v plus x times b7. Yes? And so, and so if I set v and x both equal zero, then I'm getting this copy of 112. I'm getting this exceptional. Uh, I'm getting this exceptional divisor E here. Right? But this, this hypersurface has now a biregular involution. Right? The thing that goes V goes to uh, A minus V is now a biregular involution. Right? And so, uh, you know, this, this, this surface this, this biregular involution takes this surface to some other surface, to some other copy of uh, E inside Z. And then I can, I can contract him back up to a Y plus, down to an X plus. So, so you know, who's, who is the right-hand side of this diagram? Is exactly the same thing as the left hand of the side of the diagram, except twisted by this 
by regular involution. I can take the x, because this equation is now monic, I can just use, use, use this, this operation, v goes to a minus v, to turn the z upside down, <coughs> and then this defines a, so this defines, this defines a quadratic transformation, x maps to this, x. So he's, uh, he blows up x, and at the end of it, he contracts down some new surface, some, some surface that's already existed in the x, to another point, which is isomorphic to x. So the point is that when I start off this process, I start off by doing the blow up, and then, you know, I don't know, maybe I carry out some minimal model program, and at the end of it, who knows where I end up. In this case, however, we end up completely predictably with a variety here which is isomorphic to x. So the whole point of this construction is that I go from x to x. I mean, it's a rational map, but... Uh... Okay, so when I do this contraction, uh, when I do this map y goes to z, who gets contracted? So the things that get contracted are the, are the curves passing through p that have very small degree against the anti-canonical system. So it turns out that those are straight lines of the weighted projective space that happen to pass through the point P. Right? And so uh, it, it, if, if we do this generally, and I'm skipping, I'm skipping some of the details, then the place where this A equals B equals zero is some locus inside E where Z has ordinary double points. Right? And, uh, and, you know, in general, this, uh, uh, I don't really have space on this board. Let me, let me get rid of this. So Z is uh, given by this equation, V squared plus a v plus x b b seven right and so it's a double cover ramified in the discriminant locus which is a squared minus four x v seven <coughs> right and this has ordinary ordinary nodes. at uh, a equals b is x equals c. Right. So in this case, in this case, it so happens that this is uh, uh, 28 ordinary nodes. Right. Where a and b are zero. Uh, I'm sorry. It's 28 divided by two. It's 14. This is uh, a is four. 4 times 7, and then it's divided by 2, because then P of 1, 1, 2. <clears throat> yes? And so, uh, um, you know, how, uh, how does, you know, the, the th when we end up with something, the, thing, the variety we end up with is isomorphic to X. The map here is not an isomorphism. It, 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 it contracts something, and it blows up something. Contracts, uh, it contracts 14 uh, curves, straight lines, passing through the point P. And then it blows up uh, the, the image of that under this involution. Okay. So uh, these, uh, these involutions are going to play the main, you know, play the, the main result in the statement of this, uh, of this uh, type of result. So the theorem, very roughly, of CPR is that um, if x is one of the famous 95, so this means x d, and 
and this is a crazy smooth fauna. If so, I'm going to make this uh, rigidity. Uh, if x maps to, sorry, birationally, to y over s. So this is uh, this is. Uh, I'll explain this later. I'm, I, I'm not. Uh, this is a rough statement. Mori fiber space. <coughs> So if I have one of my one of my famous 95, and if X is birational to some Mori fiber space, then Y is isomorphic to X. And X to Y is a composite of quadratic involutions. Uh, and or elliptic involutions. I'm not going to explain that just at the moment. Uh, followed by an isomorphism x to y. Right. So the so the point of, the point of this statement is this rigidity. If I start off with x up to birational equivalence, and I try to give it a different Mori fiber space structure, then the, one, the Mori fiber space structure I get at the end is just isomorphic to x. And moreover, the birational map here is not any old thing. It's a composite of these uh, quadratic, quadratic involutions I've talked about. Right, so the elliptic involution is a little bit more complicated, and I'll, I, I'll come to... I'll, 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 give you an ex, uh, a kind of little uh, oversimplified explanation of that later. Yes? So the, the quadratic involution itself here is a very straight, is a, you know, in some ways a very straight, straightforward thing. I'm taking, I'm taking this equation, I'm saying we know this birational description of an involution. Right? Just think of this u, think of this equation as a quadratic equation for u over all the other variables. Right? Then, just from the theory of quadratic, uh, f uh, just, this is just a quadratic field extension, and therefore there is an automorphism f of the function field here <coughs> uh, that just replaces u by the other, the other, its other root. So it's just this, it's just this map. Right? And so now I'm saying that this can be made into this uh, special uh, operation. Right. So the elliptic involution has a slightly more complicated uh, uh, description. I'm not going to trouble you too much with it just now. Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of change the subject a little bit and try to explain now this, uh, you know, why making this sort of grandiose and uh, uh, dis distinction between what is bi biregular and what's birational. Okay, so uh, this, this, this word by regular means, of course, up to isomorphism. Whereas by rational means up to by rational equivalent. And there's a kind of, uh, you know, the, there's a kind of best model for this. And that's the canonical model, the canonical 
model of a variety of general type. Right, so if I've got V, a variety of general type, then I can look at the vector spaces H naught of NKV. And these are, by, uh, so, so let me say V is uh, smooth or uh, canonical singularities or something, anyway. But uh, at the moment, just smooth. Right, if I look at this, then this is a birational invariant. Right. So this means that if I've got V1, let's say if, I, if I've got V1 maps to V2 morphism, right, then H naught of V2, I can do F up a star of this, and then that's equal to H naught of NKV2. Right, so so there's not this is equality. So I take I take forms on V two. I just a form is a thing that looks like D Z one wedge D Z two and so on. Right, and so if I have them if I have them if I have a form on V two, I can think of that as a form on V one just by substituting f up a star of all the the functions Z. Right, and so a form on V one remains regular on V one. On the other hand, uh, if you think about the if you think about the Jacobian matrix of F, right, then a form on, 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 a form on V1, what do I want to say? <clears throat> the, the Jacobian matrix has locus of zeros, which is the, just the exceptional locus of this map, the ramification map. I'm sorry, this is supposed to be birational. Right, so there's some locus in V1, which has got co-dimension uh, Third dimension one that gets contracted down to to V two, and uh, because it's negative, because it's a contracted morphism, it means that uh, <clears throat> by allowing poles on there, I don't get any poles. Right. So, um, well, anyway, let me let me not go into this. This is uh, this is a, an elementary point. Right. This is in uh, the Shafrevich book, for example, chapter three. <clears throat> okay, and so, so, so in other words, this this invariant here, going up to uh, V is smooth projective. I take a smooth projective variety and I ask how many differential forms, how many n times canonical forms does he have, and it doesn't depend on who V is, it only depends on uh, the birational equivalence class of V. Right, so if I make all of these guys here into the, this canonical ring, right, this is the ring of V and KV, this ring here is in, independent of the choice of V up to birational equivalence. Right, and so if I define x to be equal to proj of this guy, R V K V, it's called the canonical model. Then, then V is birational. Sorry, a V is birational bi to x, but x is unique. Right, X is proj of a given ring, and the ring does not depend on the choice of V up to birational equivalence. Right? And so, you know, I mean, if I, if, I, if I choose generators and relations for this, then the X is actually contained in a weight projective space, you know, A1 up to AN, corresponding to generators of uh, R, V, K, V. So there's this well-defined, extremely well-defined uh, <coughs> ring associated with the, the just the birational equivalence class of, a, of, v, of v, and uh, x is so. I mean, a little bit of 
worry about choice of generators. Choice of generators might give you a little group of equivalents, a group of equivalences here. But having done that, then I get a completely specific embedding of x into p of a1 up to an. So the, the prod, same prods of the ring, this is an intrinsically defined variety. It depends on v and only up to the birational equivalence class of v. And so e.g., if uh, v is c, is a curve of genus greater than or equal to 2, then we get the usual stuff about c, 2g minus 2, contained in p, g minus 1, or hyperoptic a special case. Right. And the good thing about the, the, the very good thing about this is that this, this curve is defined uniquely by the bash, by rational equivalence class of, of, the, of the curve. So if I start off with a singular curve and resolve its singularity, it doesn't matter how I do it, I end up with this, this one, one embedding, and the embedding depends here only on the choice of generators here, only on the linear equivalence there. Okay, so uh, what happens if you try to apply this, variety, this idea to uh, Fano varieties? Right, so e.g. del Pezzo surfaces. Well, uh, there's no point in working with NKV because there aren't any. With, uh, with positive sections here. But the problem is that H naught of minus NKV is certainly not birational equivalent, the birational invariant. Right, so already for del Pezzo surfaces, for example, if I take uh, S is P2, then H naught of minus KS is uh, cubics of P2. This is a 10-dimensional vector space. <coughs> right? And if I, if I do, for example, the blow-up of S in K points, then uh, H naught of minus KS, this blow-up, is cubics through those, ten, through those ten points, through those k points. Right? And so this is definitely smaller than this, as soon as k is not trivial. And this might go down to zero, or it might, it might depend on the position of the points. So, in other words, this h naught minus ks here is exactly the opposite of this birational invariant here. It's not a birational invariant, and depends quite, de quite delicately on how many times you blew up. So, uh, so Mori theory has a kind of solution to this, which is, uh, which is the, uh, which is the Sarkisa program. So Mori theory says if k, if uh, so we have to work with slightly singular varieties. So I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking of starting off with V non-singular. But anyway, let me say V has, uh, let, let me say terminal singularities. Let me say terminal Q factorial singularities. If K, V is not NEF, then there exists an extremal ray. So this means that there is some, there is some vector space, N1 of uh, V over R, and so you, know, you should think of this as being a bit like H2 of X to topological, uh, 
ordinary, t ordinary, ordinary complex topology, Z, and then tensor R. <coughs> right? It's not exactly that, but it's something quite similar to that in spirit. Right? And so inside here I have the Mori cone, any bar. So this is the effect closed cone of effective one cycles. Right? And then there's this picture of Mori theory. I'm not doing this in detail. That says if K is, KV is not an F, then there is some polyhedral structure here in the KV, in this, this, this part here, which is KV negative, in, in this cone. And the only way it's possible for the KV not to be NEF is that there should be an extremal ray there. Right? So, for example, if this, is, if this vector space is only one dimensional, then it means that minus K is, ne is ample. Right? And then, you know, there is the rays. We're talking about a ray in a one-dimensional vector space, so there's only, there isn't any choice. Right? We're, we're mostly interested in the case where this uh, is higher dimensional. Uh, anyway, then, uh, so then there exists a morphism uh, V to V, uh, let me, let me double you contracting R and then uh, if so this is this can be this can be uh, either a divisorial contraction and then V then W still uh, still has Q factorial terminal right. so, so so you know if you if you work with surfaces you know that you look around for a minus one curve and you're supposed to contract a minus one curve so this is a, the surprise for when people started doing threefolds when especially when Mori started doing threefolds the thing you're supposed to contract is not a priori a geometric locus in V the thing you're supposed to contract is one of these rays in, the, in this, in this uh, uh, group of one cycles, right? So we decide, uh, so then the thing that con gets contracted here, F contracts curves C with C in R only. Right? But you don't know in advance how many of these curves there are. There might just be a single curve, or there might be finitely many spread all, all around your variety, or maybe you're contracting a high-dimensional locus, or maybe you're contracting the whole variety to a point. All of these, all of these things are really possible. Right? So first of all, you prove that there exists this morphism, and then after that, you start asking about, well, how much gets contracted, what's the geometric properties. So in other words, first of all, you do the operation, and then you ask for the classification of these extractions, these terminal contractions. Right, and then... Uh, How uh, sorry? How one ray? One ray. Uh, uh, R is... R is... The thing I'm drawing here, R. A ray. So, one-dimensional half, half line. A half line contained in the boundary of the cone. Extremal means uh, okay. So so ray means R plus of some cycle, and uh, extremal means okay. Yes. Extremal means extremal means that uh, if I write anything in the ray as a sum of two things, then those things themselves have to be in. Okay. Uh, so so I, I said either or 
and then there's this uh, uh, flipping, which I'm not going to explain. V goes to W goes to V plus. Right? So in any case, the, uh, uh, we eventually get, to a, eventually get to a minimal model. Even eventually get to one of two things, outcomes. So one, uh, V, after some number of steps, I get to X, which is with has KX net, and still uh, those Q factorial terminal singularities. Or to uh, V goes along until it hits this X, and this X still has an extremal contraction here, but the S has, uh, so this is called a Murray fiber space. Maybe I, do the, uh, maybe I do the definition here. So there's a morphism X from X to uh, S, S. Dimension of S is strictly less than the dimension of X. It's allowed to be zero, right? And uh, minus K X, so F is a contraction ray. Of, of x with kx minus kx times r negative. Sorry, kx times r negative. Right? And uh, so, the, 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 because s has dimension less than x, I, assume, I can assume here that f ox is os. This is just Stein factorization. So this is a this is a fiber space. This is a, a big variety here that maps down to a small variety with all the connect, all the fibers connected, right? And this condition here that kx set kx is negative on all the fibers, right? So this is the complete opposite of kx being nef. Here kx in nef means that that kx is positive on every curve of x, greater than or equal to zero on every curve of x, and therefore positive on almost every curve of v, right? except for the guys that are, uh, to which some accident happens in this contraction process, in this birational contraction process, the kv is still positive. Right? Whereas here, in the Mori fiber space, the, k, the, x, the, the kx at the end here is negative on a family of curves that completely fill out x. Right? So anyway, this last case, in this last case, in Murray fiber space for three folds, for three folds, there are three cases, there are these cases. Uh, if S is a point, then it means that X over C, over spec C, X, just X absolute is uh, a finer variety. It's a finer variety with rho of x equals 1. Right, so the, here the extremal condition is saying there's only one class of curves contracted. Right, in this picture, the only curve that's contracted is this one curve. And if we're over a point, then every curve is contracted. That means all the curves are linearly equi and numerically equivalent to multiples of each other. Right, so if S is a, is a curve, then this is a, fano, this is a, a family of del Pezzo surfaces. This is a pencil, a one-dimensional a one family of del Pezzos. Or if uh, S is a surface, then it's a conic bundle. Right, so j just because of the result that I'm aiming for, I'm not very interested in these two cases just at the moment. It's part of the conclusions of Murray's theory. So in other words, uh, you know, <clears throat> the reason that we're interested in Fano varieties, especially Fano varieties rho x equals 1, is because they're the end product of this. In the same way that P2 and rational surfaces, rule surfaces, 
are the end product of the classification of surfaces in the K not an F case. These uh, finer varieties are here. Okay, so I'm explaining the process we've been through there is this birational is this birational procedure. Each step of this is birational, and then at the end I have a conclusion, which is that I have a finer variety. So when I made this canonical model, this canonical model was really wonderful in that it was completely independent of anything I did with V. If I start off with another birationally equivalent V and make his canonical ring, I get to exact one, exactly one and the same X uh, independently of who V is. Right? And so ask, we ask the same question about uh, in, in the Murray uh, situation. So suppose that I start off with a a variety, and I run a minimal model program, is the conclusion, is the final uh, result, is the outcome, uh, is the outcome uh, unique? So, so is the final x over s unique? Or unique, uniquely determined by by rational class of V? And the answer is, of course not. So, uh, so you know, I mean, the, the, these, are, these are really very simple examples. So, already in the 19th century, uh, so the, the person who really understood this properly was Castelnuovo, but, of course, people knew about it for 10 or 20 years before that. So, um, uh, you know, I can do P2, or I can do P2 blown up in a point to get F1. Right? And this one here is a Murray fiber space over P1. And, you know, this, this, this final outcome P2 and this final outcome PF1 are completely different. Or I can do the F1 over P, P1. So the F, F1 over P1 looks like this, with this minus 1 curve there. I can take some, some point on here, which is either one, uh, either one of the points of intersection on the minus 1 curve, or it's some different point, and I can, I can take a point, blow him up, and then blow down. So this is a minus 1 curve, uh, exceptional. Right, but if I do this, then the original fiber, after blowing up in one point, is still a minus one curve, and I can contract him down. So I'm going from F, if I'm going from Fi here, I could start being into Fi plus or minus one by doing this. So I can go to all of these, all of these things. So if I start off with a surface, so if I start off with V, any rational surface, And I contract down here, down to either Fn, Fn over P1 or P2. Right? These are the only these are the only possible outcomes over a field of algebra, uh, over an algebraic closed field. So I make this can I make if I make this procedure, then which of these I end up with depends in a completely in a completely crucial way on the, all the choices I made at the different times, right? And so the problem here is the ambiguity, ambiguity in the final model is the Cremona group of, uh, the Cremona, Cremona group, the birational automorphisms of P2, right? And the problem is this is an absolutely huge group. This is one of the biggest and nastiest groups that, uh, you know, rational human beings have ever considered. <clears throat> so this is sort of very bad. And so this is the opposite. The thing I'm describing here is the opposite of rigidity. It's saying these, uh, these varieties here, you can take P2, you can take your P2 and three points on it, for example, and you can take the P2 and turn him inside out and get back to a different model of P2. I mean, it so happens that's isomorphic to P2, but it's got nothing at all to do with the original P2. 
Right. So I want to I want to describe this this idea of birational rigidity. So this is basically due to the Russians. So this is especially Iskovsky and his students, but maybe especially um, Sarkisov and Pushikov. So they say rigid. So a threefold. Uh, so let, let me say a threefold uh, with Hadara dimension minus infinity. So I'm really thinking of things that are like, that are close to rational. So, you know, if something's a Fano variety, then he's uh, rationally connected. He has enough, ra enough rational curves to connect two points. E.g. rationally connected. Right. So we say these, uh, this guy is birationally rigid. So, so I take X to S a Mori fiber space. So it's birationally rigid. If, so if I've got x over s maps to a y over t, so this is any other uh, Mori fiber space, right? Then, of course, this, this map can be tearing, tearing the x apart and so on. It doesn't have to be an isomorphism, but the, but the thing that I want is that the final model is very close to the original model. So then, then a y over t is birationally equivalent to x over s. In a commutative diagram, this is not the original map, this is phi, it exists at psi, with uh, y over K of t, isomorphic under this psi to x over k of s, sorry, c of s. Yeah, and so, you know, you can't, if, uh, so let's think about the case where s is a point. So if s is a point, then it means uh, y equals x, isomorphic to x, right? So, so this is this will be the case that we're, we're interested in. I've got x over a point, so I'm assuming that x is a Q Fano variety. Yes. Suppose that I have a birational map from this x to some other to some other Mori fiber space to some other total space of a Mori fiber space. I'm not assuming anything about t. Right? So, in other words, suppose I take a Fano variety and let's assume, for example, that he's, you know, one of those things I said, a, a conic bundle or a, a P1 bundle or another Fano. Then the rigid condition says, if this happens, then actually the final Y is isomorphic to X. Right? This is a more complicated, this is a more complicated uh, general, general thing. So, so this program is now sort of pretty well understood, pretty well. Uh, this is a good definition. The, de the proper definition, I think, is due to quantity. <clears throat> okay, so CPR says, if I take these xd in P of A1, well, I already stated it, x1 up to a4. Fairly general. Uh, hypersurface. In one of the 95 families. Yeah. 
then x is rationally rigid. Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to describe some of the steps in the proof of this. This is a complicated theorem, and uh, uh, you know, already the statement is pretty complicated, but the, the proof takes us uh, about 80 pages. So uh, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to be able to give a complete proof of this, but I'm going to give, be able to talk about some of the ideas. Yes? So uh, the first... The first case of this, and it really opened up the whole subject, is uh, um, Fano and then Iskowski Manin's treatment of, uh, of a general non singular uh, X. Four in P four. Yes, and so this is. Uh, so they prove. They prove that. Uh, they prove that if X is uh, birational to Y over S, then this map phi, the given the given birational map phi X is isomorphic to y. Right. Phi itself is an isomorphism. So this is much stronger than uh, rigidity. The Russians call this birationally super rigid. So I'll explain, I'll explain some of the strategies for proving this. It gets quite complicated, of course, but uh, uh, this is now... So the Russians, uh, Iskovsky and Puklikov and uh, uh, Yuri Prokhorov uh, put together different proofs of this, which sort of simplify and simplify the iskovsky manning proof. iskovsky manning proof was really very, very horrible, very, very uh, difficult proof. And then uh, I think our paper, our, our book contains, you know, I don't know, the best proof. The only proof with my name on it, anyway. <coughs> okay. Starting... Four. 